Here's the good news. When I grew up, we were told we were run out of water, we were run out of food, the ozone posed an existential threat. We were told that hum all those things we were told. But human creativity and ingenuity changed those outcomes. And I know that the human capacity to address these challenges are in this room and in the high schools and colleges across the country. So to tell you, where's Rob? Why this is all going to be OK and how you can all take advantage of catastrophe that we've created to make billions of dollars for yourselves and your friends is Rob from Microsoft, followed by Bruno from UBS, and a panel discussion with Jessica and April from Appeal Sciences and CEC. Thank you so much for coming. Hope you enjoy the whole program. That was the best warm-up act I've ever had. Thank you, Albert. Um, I'm Robert Bernard. I am the Chief Environmental Strategist at Microsoft. People often ask me what that is and what we do. Hopefully, by the end of the talk, you'll know what that is and what I do. But more importantly, and Albert did talk about this a lot, which is we have a story that we've been telling ourselves as a society. And I would actually say that you guys are in a different place than pretty much most of the planet, frankly. So I've been doing this job. I've been heading sustainability at Microsoft for 10 years. And I used to have to work really hard to be able to find an audience of 10 or 15 people to talk to about this problem. And so the world has started to wake up, right? And there's this thing called the Anthropocene. Have people heard of the Anthropocene, right? It's no longer the age where the planet influences humans. It's now the age where humans influence the planet. And so the thing that actually worries me a little bit is we have a new story as a society, which is people think we are awake. We understand the problem. We've got to keep climate change at two degrees. We've got to feed the population. Two billion people don't have energy. We've got to go do these things. But we're actually still not really paying attention yet. So how many people saw the news a few weeks ago? The Arctic Circle was 35 degrees above normal. Not once, but more than twice. I think it was twice and maybe a third time. They thought the instrumentation was broken. Right? So this is not like a two degree change, oh, the planet shifts, it moves. That's the story that most people think they're telling themselves today. But the situation is actually far worse. And Albert talked a little bit about it, and Cape Town is a great example of how scary things will get. Microsoft has an office in Cape Town. We're doing a lot, actually, to try to get water to hospitals, because it turns out that when you turn on the, off the taps, everybody goes off, schools, hospitals, everything. So the world is in a very precarious place. And so it's kind of tough with the intro with Albert talking about this, which is, so why is there hope? And I'm actually super, super hopeful because I'm really fortunate that I work at the intersection of two eras. The first is the Anthropocene, and that's the scary one. The second one is the advent of artificial intelligence. And that's what I'm going to spend most of tonight talking about, which is how do we take and harness the power of artificial intelligence, which is transforming the way we live every single day in ways you may not even realize that happen to you every single day, and apply them to the area of sustainability. So this last summer, Microsoft launched and revamped its entire strategy on the back of artificial intelligence. And we launched with basically uh, three areas of focus, and one of them was called Artificial Intelligence for Earth, or AI for Earth. So the company's not confused about how important is it to take the advent of artificial intelligence and apply it to Earth? And as the chief environmental strategist, people always say, well, what do you do? What does your team do when you wake up in the morning? Right? Because a lot of people have chief sustainability officers, but that's not what our team does. We think about this, which is how do you empower every person or an organization on the planet to thrive in a resource-constrained world? And I'll talk about some of those constraints, but uh, the fact that you guys are all here and came out, I think most of you already know most of these things. And Albert talked about a bunch of them, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on those. But when we think about resource-constrained world, there's so many ways to think about it. We think about it in the areas of water, energy, circular economy, carbon, ag food, land use, and biodiversity. I think people aren't surprised that a company like Microsoft thinks about energy. We use as much energy, anybody want to guess? So data centers around the world, we have dozens of data centers around the world, and they take a lot of power. Microsoft uses more energy today than a small state. We use more energy than the state of Wyoming, Vermont, Alaska. 
We don't think it's actually very difficult to conceive of a world within 10 years where we'll use as much energy as a small nation. So how do we actually play our part in creating a clean economy and power our infrastructure in ways that are contributing instead of degrading the planet? So these are the areas that we focus in. I'm going to go through each of these in a little bit, and I'll talk about where we're headed. But in each area, there's two things that we do. We think about how do we operate as a company. I just mentioned, for example, the fact that you know, we use as much energy as a small state. And we're, we're carbon neutral, and I'll explain what that is in a second. But increasingly, which has been the exciting part of my job over the last few years, is we say, no, we actually have to have a societal goal. Because a company, yeah, we're a Fortune 5 or 10 company. I think Albert said we're one of the five wealthiest companies in the world. That's great. We have a billion customers. That's great. But the reality is we could do everything right and it won't matter. Right? Because, you know, I'll talk about it in the context of our operations. Doing great in one state isn't interesting. You've got to do it everywhere all the time. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to invent our way out of it. So we say, look, we want a sustainable development of a low-carbon business practices. We want to transform the infrastructure. Right? One of the great things about being at a company like Microsoft, it's like we are the foundation of the infrastructure of the digital age. So we should be not only wanting to, but we should be held accountable to actually transform the way we use resources on a planetary level. So just to give you some scale, we've been the second or third largest purchaser of green energy in the United States for the last five years. And we win awards, and every year I say the same thing, which is, boy, that's terrible. Why is it terrible? Because we're not the second or third largest energy consumer in the United States, so why should we be the second or third largest green energy consumer in the United States? So how do we actually get all of our peers, our competitors, our customers, so that we're number 15 or 20? Not because we're not doing the right thing, but because everybody else is doing the same thing. We've done about 9.5 million tons of carbon, and we've impacted 7 million people around the world. So the way carbon neutrality works is, we first try to buy as much green energy as we can. We can't buy green energy in a lot of places around the world. That's an unfortunate reality. I'll talk about that in a second. So then we go buy basically renewable energy certificates, which basically help finance clean energy projects all over the world. And then with uh, a staff of people traveling several billion miles a year in planes, we have to offset that carbon as well because we don't control the fuel source. So where do we do that? We do clean energy deals, which I'll talk about, but we do projects all over the world, clean cook stoves, reforestation projects, water reclamation projects, all sorts of stuff in all of these different countries, 38 projects, 22 countries, over 7 million people. And that's really exciting, but the thing that we're now, now trying to think about is in every one of these communities, and I'll talk about this in a minute, how can we help them leverage technology so it's not us just giving them a check? Like, we're fortunate Microsoft has money, but money isn't the answer. Like, we're just not going to give money to people and expect that that's how we're going to buy our way out of climate change and water problems and all these other things. So it's about empowering people. That's our mission. Empowering every person and organization on the planet to thrive in a resource-constrained world. So we've been carbon neutral for a few years, and something occurred to us about three years ago, which is, how do you optimize a resource you don't really measure? So I don't know how many people have here have ever thought about or looked at how carbon is measured, but I'll tell you really quickly how it works. So on January 1st of this year, our team gets together and we say, we have to get the accounting for 2017 of our carbon footprint. We hire people who go all over the planet, look at all of our bills from literally hundreds of offices and data centers around the world. We gather all that information. We said, this is how many kilowatts that we use in this location, this location, this location. We go to a table, we look it up, we multiply the average carbon for a year, and I'll talk about why that's important in a second, times a kilowatt hour consumption, and by June 1st of this year, I will know how much carbon Microsoft expended into the air for last year. Now imagine if I told you you wanted to optimize your bank account, and I said, hey, I'm going to tell you your balance on January 1st of 2017, on June 1st of 2018. Pretty hard to balance your checkbook. Pretty hard to optimize carbon when you actually have no idea what's going on. And then instead of telling you I actually had $352 on your bank in January, I'll say, ah, you know what? We can't really tell you how much money we had on that day. We're just going to give you the average for the year. So you had $37 on the year. That's carbon accounting. That's state-of-the-art carbon accounting. And by the way, that costs a couple hundred thousand dollars for us to do a year. 
Okay, so we looked at this and we said, there's got to be a better way to do this. This is crazy. Like, if I want to optimize carbon in every one of our offices around the world, how do we do that? Well, it turns out you do it with software, right? Not surprising. So we wrote this piece of software over the course of the last few years, which says, in almost every market in the world, there's a legal requirement that power plants talk about what they're putting into the power plant. And there's something called an API. We can grab that information. And what we started to do is we looked at, this is the average number. But the reality is Microsoft runs a lot of its business in the middle of the night when the wind is blowing and the carbon is really low. Right? So we basically said, OK, if I want to go use the grid right now, what I really care about is not even the average carbon on the grid. I care about the plant that is currently running to serve my infrastructure, because that's how much carbon I am putting into the atmosphere when I plug in our data center, when I turn on the light. That's a new way of thinking about carbon. You don't think about averages. You think about exactly what you're doing. And this example basically said, look, it's 13% below the average, so you're going to do better than average today. And so we're now deploying this around the world, and what we're going to tell the world is two things. We're going to give them two numbers. The first number is, how much carbon do we have under the old antiquated way of accounting carbon? The second is, what's our real carbon? Because I go to universities all over the world and companies, and they say, we want to reduce our carbon. And I say, what's your carbon? And they say, well, we told CDP it was 200,000 tons, or in our case, 3 million tons. That's not your number. You might be higher, you might be lower. Start with the real number, then figure out what to do. Now, once you have this information, it changes what you can do with automated software. So we think about how do we take this into the power grid? Because if I know I've got an automated job, and with artificial intelligence, more and more of manufacturing is the reality is it's done by machines. So when I turn those machines on, I'm pulling energy from the grid. Why wouldn't I pull energy from the grid when the carbon is close to zero? I just need an engine, a rules engine, to let me do that. But first, you need to know your carbon. Then you need to know what the grid's producing, and then you need to automate. So that's where we're trying to go with the software. In our own facilities, we're going to be 50% powered by wind, hydro, and solar by the end of this year. We're well on path for that and we'll be 60% early the next decade and keep going from there. And that's great, but really what it's about is how do you actually green all the grids around the world? And that's where artificial intelligence is critical because we have this old infrastructure in most of the world which does not know how to deal with clean energy. So this is Microsoft's deals. There's actually a couple more. We just announced two weeks ago the largest deal in history in Singapore, solar deal. We did a solar deal in India last week. We have more news coming out uh, in the very near future. But we're constantly doing new, new deals, and we're trying to do them in ways that change the rules. So people go out and they buy wind farms or they buy solar farms. That's kind of interesting. What we're thinking about is how do you actually change the infrastructure? Because when Microsoft builds a data center, I don't know that you know this. We actually build a power plant in the data center because I think nobody in this room would like the idea that their bank accounts go down if the power grid goes down. And because all of our infrastructure now sits in the cloud, we build new data centers, we build new power plants. So in a couple of these states, we actually said, look, we'll be the backup grid for your grid. So instead of building a new gas-fired plant or a coal plant, we'll provide the power for you. Now, the other thing that we said is, Microsoft, just to give you scale on campus, 60,000 people a day, 55 megawatt average, $60 million a year in energy, third cheapest energy market in the United States, one of the most moderate climates. We said, look, we have 2 million data points, 2 million connection points across 35,000 pieces of mechanical equipment, six building management systems. We were gathering 500 million points of data a day, and we're doing nothing with it. So we said, wait a second. What can we do in our own buildings that we can experiment with? And what we ended up doing is we actually reduce our energy consumption by using that data by 20%. So our energy bill went from 60 million down to 48 million. Okay? So Albert talked about single biggest economic opportunity. I can tell you that many of the biggest real estate development companies in the world and many software startup companies are going after this math. 20% of all electricity in every building is wasted in every experiment we've done. It's between 15, 20, 25% over and over and over. And there's some reasons behind it, and I could talk about it in the Q&A, but you find the same patterns over and over because machines see things that we will never see. I walk into an office, I'm comfortable. The heating and the air conditioning is on. I don't call the building manager. One system talks to this system. One system talks over here. 
We have air conditioning and heating on in offices all over the world all the time. Now the other problem is, this is great, we got power, right? Two billion people don't have this, right? That's what this table's about, right? This is a problem. What's the number one barrier to people getting power in developing nations? That's what I thought. Till this company, M. Copa, came to our office. The guys who started this started something called M-Pesa. I don't know if anybody knows what that is. It's a mobile payment system in Africa. Everybody uses it now. They said the number one reason people can't get power, yeah, there's supply problems, there are distribution problems, there are grid problems. They have no credit. They show up to buy something and they have no credit. They don't have a social security number. They don't have a bank account. They have nothing. So these guys with us, we created some artificial intelligence that said, how can you infer somebody's credit rating based on just a few questions? And how do you actually get there? And what they found is with just a handful of questions, depending where they are geographically, those questions might change, depending on the age of the person, their sex, they can get credit, over 90% repayment rate. And then they put them on to the grid, and because of some other technologies that we're working with, all of those solar panels are connected to the cloud, and you can see everybody's use pattern, and you can tell from their use pattern, oh, that person might be ready for agricultural services or compute. And so you get computers in the household. And so this is changing. They've done about 700,000 uh, households in Africa over the last three years. And now we're adding a couple more companies to this. So it turns out that the problem that I thought, even being an environmentalist, which is, well, there's no grid. Yeah, that is a problem. But it turns out there are underlying problems that are actually part of this as well. So. We look at this and we say, that's sort of one set of problems is energy efficiency. The next set of problems is the developing world. The third problem is, how many people think electrification of vehicles is a great thing for our society because we'll get off of petrochemical oil gas cars, right? So, and there's this big promise that we're gonna plug in all these electric cars and there'll be battery storage and it can feed into the grid. So the number one country in the world for electric vehicle penetration, anybody know? Norway, who's somebody who said Norway? Yep, Norway. They have a tax incentive where basically if you buy an oil and gas car, or a gas car, it's like 100% tax. So that kind of dissuades people from buying gas cars. So electric vehicle penetration starts increasing in Norway. They haven't replaced their infrastructure with it, which they've built since the 1950s. So each of these things, you ever see, anybody know what a substation is, right? You drive by these little substations in the power grid and they have capacity. And it turns out in Norway that capacity is about 10 megawatts. Except all the electric vehicles were coming in and plugging in. They needed 12 megawatts in a 10 megawatt capacity. So now they're gonna say, oh, we gotta actually rebuild all the physical infrastructure and increase the size of our power plants. So they called us and they said, what can we do with software? And so we work with this company over the course of a year and I'll let you see what they had to say. Agra is a hydropower company located in the south of Norway. We have been basically running the same operation for decades. The world is changing so fast around us. Our customers want to add solar panels on their rooftops, want to use EV cars. That is challenging our grid. If we were to continue the way that we've been doing all along, we would have to invest in a lot of new capacity. The smart grid pilot program that we did with Microsoft was looking into the grid and see how could we use new technology to actually operate the grid in a new way. Everything now is digitalized, so everything is now updated on a monitor by the operators. We see that the substation is going in heavy overload. And then we can make decisions on changing the production and changing the consumption. And what we found was that we could actually interact with the customers in order to reduce the load on specific components in the grid through new technology using Azure Cloud Solutions. The fourth industrial revolution is about connecting things together. We now can collect data from millions of sensors in our systems, in our grid, in our production and we can use this data to make new products, take decisions and manage our business in a whole new way. Machine learning or advanced analytics actually make it possible to utilize the resources you already have, giving customers better service to a better price. We are in the middle of a transformation of the utility sector. 
it will be more customer focused. Customer can place uh, solar PV on his rooftop and then supply back into the grid. And by that, they could help us as a power company to become more efficient in many ways. And that will also help the customer. Agda Energy has produced renewable power since the start. That gives us first-hand insights in challenges. We can actually be also a part of that solution, we believe. So the challenge, there's two challenges. So in Norway, the challenge was they didn't have enough power in their grid to service the new demand for electric vehicles. The opposite problem, which you have here in the state of California, and they have acutely in Germany, is there is so much production of micro solar panel on rooftops, they literally throw the power away because the system can't handle the influx of new clean energy. And so we're working on a project there which does the opposite, which says, how do you create clearing markets so that you can move demand to be when there's supply? So you remember before I talked a little bit about using artificial intelligence in manufacturing and carbon? This is exactly where it all comes together where you say, look, I can move the demand, and I can move the supply, and I can optimize for microgrids and battery storage and vehicles and everything else to actually transform the way grids that are already built operate. And so that's where we get super excited, because then it's not about Microsoft and a data center. It's about the entire infrastructure of the utilities around the world at scale. And the good news is solar penetration is increasing dramatically but the grid can't handle it, so we better invent our way out of it. The companies that are being financed by startups, companies that you guys can go work at, are going to find the new economic paradigm. This is no different than how Airbnb or Uber or something else just reinvented the rules. The annual transaction volume in energy around the world is $3 trillion a year. So now imagine saving 20% of energy, shifting supply and demand, moving things around and optimizing that amount of capital. So that's the scale of stuff that we're thinking about when we think about what are the new business opportunities look like. Water, Albert talked about water and I'm you know, in Cape Town, right? So we have a goal, operational goal, societal goal. I'm guessing somebody in this room knows what percentage of the world's water is fresh water. 3%. What percentage of that water is available for human consumption on the planet? Yeah, two-thirds is unavailable. That means we have 1%. And the math is really simple, which is at our current rate of water consumption, we will need 40% more water for the human population than is available on the planet by 2030. We can do a lot of desalinization for some areas on the coast, which has different problems. We don't solve this problem without changing use patterns. So what do we do? First thing is actually understand the problem. What percentage of electricity in the state of California is engaged with either moving water or using water for cooling? 30% of the energy in the state of California, electricity, is used to move water, 20% of natural gas. So when you solve water, you solve energy. And of course, you solve the same problems at the same time. We talked about South Africa. Arab world loses the equivalent of the entire Dead Sea of fresh water every seven years. These numbers are not sustainable. So we worked with this company called Ecolab. If you go to a hotel, if you look at the carts, there's a little bottle there that says Ecolab. But they bought the world's largest water management company in the world. And we said, look, people do not understand. This is exactly what Albert was saying, which is, Okay, so your water bill's 90 bucks a month, 70 bucks a month, 100 bucks a month, but when the water goes off, is it worth $100 a month? No, it's your life. It's literally Cape Town. Four million people, no water. So we wrote this tool, which basically, and it's free, it's open source. That's the other thing, we're not trying to commercialize this stuff. It's free open source software. It says, what is your real water risk? And then we ran it against all of Microsoft facilities around the world, and you know what we found out? We're in big trouble, right? San Antonio, not exactly like Seattle, where I'm from. Not a lot of water in San Antonio. We had a big data center there. We still do. Turns out that in most places, when they pipe these things, when you actually use water for cooling, you use drinking water. Why does my air conditioning industrial cooling system need drinking water? 
Anybody want to guess what our data center used in one year? 70 million gallons of drinking water that we were taking from people to put into an industrial building, right? So we said, wait a second, and we went through all of our facilities around the world, we started to do this. We ran into battles in regulatory issues in many places where they don't want you to use what's called gray water. But we were able in a couple of places, we've repiped. In San Antonio, we reduced our fresh water, drinking water by 56 million gallons in one location. So now we're, thank you. So now we're doing this around the world. And the thing is, I always get asked, like we go to people like literally the head of some of these countries like Iceland and Greenland say, put your data centers in Iceland. It's cold, you, you can use, there's lots of water. And I say, no, 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 the design principle, and the guy who runs Microsoft's data center, he says this all the time too, it's like, the way you need to get the sustainable behavior is you need to design a data center that'll run in the Sahara Desert, disconnected from the grid, with no water. That's how you solve the problem. You don't go to places where there are lots of resources and deplete the resources there. So, ecosystems. This one I get really excited about and really depressed about. The average extinction rate today is 1,000 times the rate at which we would expect to see extinction. 1,000 times. It's 100 times the rate at which we'll sustain human population. The current estimates, because people don't know, is that it'll take us another 175 years to catalog all the species on the planet. We don't have 175 years, we don't know what's going on, we really don't know what the actual populations of most species on the, on the planet are. And so how do we actually use artificial intelligence to do this? This is, I think, one of the most interesting challenges we have and most interesting opportunities because when I talked originally about we're still sleeping in our story, we think of animals as out there and humans as in here. Like, we're out of phytoplankton, we're out of food, right? We're out of microbial soil and health. There was a study that came out a month ago that says by 2040, most of the arable land in the UK will not be able to be farmed. That's about species extinctions. Microspecies, but species. So how do we get after this problem? So we created this program called AI for Earth, Agriculture, Water, Biodiversity, and Climate. We've made a pledge of $50 million over the next five years to this program. And the program works in three ways. The first thing is, how many people here at university, right? Okay. People know what a GPU is, but a, a GPU, so there's a CPU, which is what's in your computer at home, right? There's a GPU. Just think about it as the difference between like a Toyota Prius and a Ferrari, right? And most of us, I don't have a Ferrari in my yard, right? Like I don't have access to it, but Microsoft is building the Ferraris, if you will, or the Teslas more appropriately of compute, they're called GPUs. But they're really, they allow you to do things at transformational speed. And so what we've done is we said, look, we're gonna go build a bunch of infrastructure and provide free access to anybody in this room who can think about new and interesting novel ways to apply artificial intelligence to any environmental challenge across those four areas that I mentioned, right? And in the first six months, we've given out over 65 grants in over 30 countries on all of these different areas, everything from how do you actually use artificial intelligence to try to figure out what's causing orca whale die-off, salmon species habitat, phytoplankton in the ocean, crop yields, farming, all sorts of different stuff, and I'll talk about it. The second area is, yeah, the guys in my office know how to use artificial intelligence. How many people here think that if I gave you free access to artificial intelligence tools, you'd know how to use them tomorrow? I didn't see any hands. Okay, this is a big problem. So we're actually running periodic education summits, and we're creating a series of videos so that you can get access to our stuff, and then you can learn how to use it. Because you guys are all pretty much too young for all of those who raise your hands who are under 30, but it, the way I view it, it's like, we never used to watch streaming TV. Even 10, 15 years ago, you had VCRs, it was impossible to use. Now everybody uses streaming on every device. I use it on my phone, I use it at the house. It's everywhere all the time, it's ubiquitous, it's easy to use. This is the challenge for us with artificial intelligence. In five years, when I say, how many people here know how to use artificial intelligence or use it? If we're doing our jobs, everybody raises their hand because it's easy. So we're creating educations and other stuff. And the last area which I'll talk about is how do you fuel innovation at scale? 
So when people make grant applications to us, we always ask, is this something that can transform the way the world works? And if the answer is yes, we go all in with them. So there's this organization called the Chesapeake Conservancy, and they had actually said that the way they used to work is they used to build literally tables. Like you've all been to exhibits, right? Where there's a watershed and you look at it and it's a map. And so you can look at what's going on. That was state of the art. Then they actually hired a bunch of technologists and there's something called a, basically you annotate text. So you and I can look at an aerial image of Santa Barbara and you go, oh, that's my house. There's the curb, there's the tree, there's the roof. A computer sees a blob. It's called 30 meter resolution. So think about like a football stadium. That's all it can see. It can't see anything else. And so you have to actually spend a lot of money and a lot of time annotating the image so that a computer knows that's a roof, that's a curb, that's a tree, or that's this species of tree. You, most of the people who do that work today are actually postdocs, right? And it, it takes 18 months and millions of dollars to do it as state of the art. But this organization went after the Chesapeake I've been a waterman on the Chesapeake Bay since 1995. When you're out there on the water every day for that long, you see how things have changed. It's hard knowing there's nothing you can do but watch. My name is Bob Ingersoll, and I'm a farmer. The demand for our kind of work is only going up, and we're constantly looking at how to expand our yield without stripping the land or polluting the bay. The Chesapeake Conservancy has been focused on creating tools that help answer some of these questions. In the infancy of the Chesapeake Bay program, scientists built a scale physical model of the bay to understand how processes worked and to simulate potential solutions. A lot has changed since then, and technology has been the catalyst. The Chesapeake Conservancy has been a pioneer in the field of precision conservation getting the right practices in the right places, but it hasn't always been easy. Until recently, land cover data was only available at 30 meters resolution and represented what the landscape looked like seven years ago. Not great for precision planning. We raised the support and spent 18 months working with our partners to create a one meter land cover database for the Chesapeake Bay program. This unprecedented project took a lot of effort and massive computing power. Now we are working with Microsoft and using AI and deep learning to accelerate our work both in the Chesapeake and across the country. Our collaboration is aimed at providing partners with the information they need to make informed decisions. The Microsoft Cloud is freeing up organizations to spend less time on technology and more time on conservation. Working with a conservancy, I am now able to restore and protect my lands with the same level of precision that I grow my crops. This allows me to focus on what I need to do, provide food for people while sustaining the land and the bay. I love this water. I love this work. It's a special place out here, and it's up to us to protect it. I'll, I'll talk through it, which is 100,000 square miles, two terabytes of imagery, took them 18 months at state of the art to do a land cover map. Now, I won't get into a lot of detail, but if you have a piece of property, like I talked to the forestry agencies, I talked to departments of natural resource around the world, they do not know what is happening on the ground because it takes 18 months and normally the images they're using when they start are two years old. So by the time they get a map, the map is four years old. Now just to put that into perspective right here, like what do you think the map of, you created a high resolution map, unfortunately, of Montecito based on images that were four years old would look like today? Do you think that would help people here right now trying to figure out how do they actually monitor and manage what's happening in Montecito with all the slides? No. And this happens in Washington State. We have landslides all the time. Things get deforested, roads change, and there is no way to do high resolution land cover maps. So we said, okay, what if we actually applied artificial intelligence to this with this organization? And we said, we're gonna take what took 18 months and $2 million, we did it in 150 hours. 120,000 square miles, 91% accuracy the first time. 
This will change the way every piece of land everywhere in the world is imaged and managed. Whether you're, like I said, forest management, wildlife preservation, land use, landslides, water, all of this gets transformed. When I talk to customers who are in this space, this is massive. Now back to Albert's theme. If you want to be in any business that manages or uses a resource on the planet, these are the kinds of tools that are going to reinvent the businesses that use resources. So there will be a wave of startups, we're already starting to see them, who will go after all of the different businesses that will be transformed by this model. Because things that took 18 months and $2 million will take a couple hours and be free. Okay, um, this is how it works. It's open source. The second area is farming. How many people have heard of this thing called precision farming where like, we're going to be in farms, we're going to digitize everything. That's great, right? There's no way to get data in and out of a farm today. They're all disconnected. They don't have high-speed internet. They don't know how to do stuff. They don't have sensors in the ground. So this guy, he invented something called TV white spaces, where basically with an antenna about this big, you can get high-speed internet on any farm anywhere in the world. And with that information, he's also created a way to actually put sensors in the soil. And the other thing is, people talk about drones. You're going to fly your fields, you're going to see what's going on. Drones are expensive, they take power. A lot of developing nations, they don't have the power to recharge these drones. So we figured out a way to take your cell phone, put it on a balloon, float it above your field for a couple of days, beam all the images to that little box, and the box connects to the cloud, and you can see everything that's going on in your farm. We ran this pilot in India, first year with 1,000, the next year with 3,000 farmers. The yield increase in farms in India went up 20% in one year. Water use went down, pesticide use went down, chemical use went down. It's artificial intelligence applied to farming. We need to get to the place where we cannot get to 40% more water by the year 2030. We have to do it in new and interesting ways. And I'll end on this story, which is, to me, just blows my mind. So. Today, state-of-the-art for tracking animals, if you want to track elephants, you get in a plane, same way you did it in the 1960s, and you get binoculars. And you walk around, you go, oh, I think that's elephant number one, that's elephant number two, that's elephant number two, three, that's the zebra, that's rhino, that's this, that, and the other thing. Do it on the ground, you do it in the air. So this guy, his name's Ethan, came to my office, and he said, you know, we built this machine which uses artificial intelligence, and I can train it to look for anything. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, it has infrared cameras and auditory devices. So I can look at the wing beat of any insect, and I can hear it, and I can tell what's going on. I said, well, how does that help with animal tracking? He said, well, mosquitoes sting animals. So I can train this thing to say, in fact, we're doing it with this with Jane Goodall right now, is I can train it to look for gorillas, mountain gorillas. I can train it to look for deer. I can train it to look for anything. And now, all of a sudden, it basically, it attracts the animals, it has an attraction for the mosquitoes. Mosquitoes fly in, it listens, it takes an image, it says, oh, that's a mosquito we're looking for, or it's not. If it's a mosquito it's looking for, and it's infrared, it has blood in, it, blood in its abdomen, shut the trap. Then you sequence the RNA, you run it against every known living organism in the database, and it gives you a map of all the organisms that are in the area. So, he took something that was pretty much impossible to do, which we've been doing the same way since the 1950s and 60s, and has literally reinvented the way we will track animals moving forward. The second thing that will happen with animal tracking is this iNaturalist. So we all take pictures. I can take pictures of anything. I can take pictures of my friends, my kids, my family, anything. And artificial intelligence will tell me, oh, that's your dog, that's your son, that's whatever, right? What if you applied it to animals? So this organization, we've done two deals, uh, which is basically training it to say, each of these zebras, these are Grevy zebra, each has a different stripe pattern. You and I probably can't see it, but a computer can see it like that. So now you can actually start to do a census of every single animal, and you can look at it, and you go, okay, great, I can tell the unique individuals within any given species anywhere in the world. Now the other thing is, what you can do, and I won't go through exactly how it works in the interest of time, is you can use the data that comes off the machine and allow you to do that, but what you also can do is you can say to people, look, what about all the species of plants 
of insects, of birds that we're trying to track. So with iNaturalist and Microsoft and a couple of other places, we're trying to use basically computer vision and auditory files to catalog every species of plant and animal everywhere in the world over the next few decades, taking that 175-year process down to a decade or two. And that will allow us to understand invasive species movement, tracking of endangered animals, where habitats are threatened and where they are not threatened, because today it is all a little bit of black magic. So this is a way computing power will totally transform our understanding of the world in which we live. So I started out with this, which says, empower every person and organization on the planet to thrive in a resource-constrained world. We talked about the lack of water, carbon, biodiversity, food and agriculture. And I, I go all over the place, and normally I'm talking, frankly, to people in my generation who are, like, trying to preserve the status quo, maybe, right? and they're trying to figure out how do they eke 5 10% efficiency gains out of their business, like, we're not going to solve this problem with 5 or 10%. So the reality is there's only one resource which is not constrained. That's human ingenuity. That's you guys. You've got to measure your way out of it. And we can do it. Thank you. Can you turn me on for just a second? Okay, just real quick, I'm gonna, um, we're going to switch speakers now. Um, we're going to make a slight change from having a video in between the next speaker and the panel. Hi, I'm Seth Streeter with SustainableFuture.org, and I'm excited to share with you a little bit about our movement. About two years ago, after working with numerous environmental nonprofits in Santa Barbara, I had this aha moment. Why don't we try to somehow unify all these incredible organizations and the great programs that they bring around one central theme dealing with climate change? And then this idea expanded as I talked to numerous community leaders in Santa Barbara. Over 100 people, in fact, have been involved with this inception of this idea. And that is to include gamification and technology to really make these actions measurable and impactful in our community. So here we are, ready to roll this out to Santa Barbara County at Earth Day in April next month. And we're going to have 10,000 users sign up, we hope, by the end of 2018 and 100 to 250 organizations. So I would love to ask you to join sustainablefuture.org, get yourself signed up, and see how we can be a shining example for environmental stewardship, community resiliency after the Thomas fires and the mudslides, and personal well-being. After all, environmental stewardship is in our DNA. We are the home to Earth Day, and we should be an example for other communities to follow when it comes to sustainability. Thank you.
just have the next speaker up, which is Bruno from UBS, and then we'll go directly into panel and Q&A. Is that okay with everybody? And I want to introduce Bruno. The reason why we invited him is you've heard from me talking big picture about how much money is going to be involved, the impact, and why there's so much opportunity. And then you've heard from Rob talking very specifically about businesses that are going to flourish and grow and do dramatically well. But none of this is possible. None of it is possible unless the capital markets recognize the opportunity to invest in these companies and create in them. And so Bruno is, I want to say, the senior portfolio manager of UBS. And he actively looks for companies and organizations that deal specifically with sustainability and funds them. And just as a note of background, Bruno um, graduated from Oberlin, which I think you all know is a hotbed of communist thinking. Um, so I'll let you uh, observe whether you think that his plan for investing in sustainability is really just a Russian plot to undermine American capitalism, or if you think he's making this decision based on pure capitalistic greed. Okay, um, so with that, I want to welcome uh, Bruno up and uh, let him take the floor. <clears throat> so uh, thanks for having me. So let me start uh, first by talking a little bit about uh, my first experience in the investment business. I graduated from uh, the business school and I started a job as an analyst at uh, T. Rowe Price in Baltimore. And I had a lot of book learning and I knew a lot about finance, but how to actually make real live investment decisions, that's really something that you kind of learn on the job. And I don't have any slides, so I don't need that. Um, so uh, the first thing I did was to go to the library in, at the company that I work for. And the founder of the company, Mr. Price, uh, was a chemist by trade. He had gone to Swarthmore. And he kept meticulous notes and little notebooks of all the companies that he had visited and all the decisions he had, he had made. And I figured, I'll read some of those and I'll figure out you know, uh, how this all works. So uh, I pulled one of the early notebooks off the wall and uh, this was he had started the company in 1930. So uh, at that time, uh, the DuPont company was the Google of its day. In one of the first notebooks I pulled off the wall, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, he said, I went to see the DuPont company in Wilmington, Delaware, this is circa 1940. They have this new product called nylon. And he said, I went to the uh, McCrory's in Wilmington, which was a now bankrupt uh, uh, five and dime store, and I asked the ladies in there about this, you know, nylon stockings, and they said they were cheaper, easier to wash, and more durable than silk stockings. Under that, he wrote, I think we have a winner here. And that was a real light bulb moment for me because I realized right away that the whole secret to the investment business was just to find a company that produced a product or a service that solved a problem, and you were 90% of the way there. Now, you have to figure out what you are willing to pay for that company. But if the company is successful as a business model, you as an investor are bound to succeed with it. And uh, so I've taken that idea with me all throughout my career. Now, uh, let's start by talking first about how people actually pick the companies in which they invest. So first of all, I uh, just want to explain that I invest in companies that are public already. So the stock is trading in the stock exchange. So uh, what we're actually trying to do is to outsmart the market. You know, for us to be successful, we have to buy companies that the market doesn't really quite completely understand or identify companies that the market thinks are worth a lot of money, but they're not and avoid them and vice versa, find companies that are worth a lot more than people think they are. So what we're really trying to do is to collect data to predict the future to make good investment decisions. And um, if, if you want to understand the social function behind what we're doing is we're managing the pension funds of teachers and actors and policemen and firemen around the world. So what we're trying to do is to generate the money that they're going to basically retire on. That's most of my clientele. So. Uh, the social function is that if we can generate a return better than the one that they expect or one that's better than what the pension fund expects, 
well, they're gonna have a nicer apartment. They can go on a cruise. They can send their kids to college. So it's a very, very important social function, but this is reliant on our ability to make good investment decisions. So the early part of the investment industry is all based out of a book that was published in 1934 by these two guys, Ben Graham and David Dodd. They're the guys that, uh, that uh, Warren Buffett talks about. And they wrote this book right after the Depression because people have made crazy, stupid investment decisions by getting tips from their barber or something like that. And um, besides the fact that the Depression ruined their portfolios, they'd also made a lot of stupid decisions. And there are three really key ideas in the book that still work today. And the first is uh, the idea that you should gather every piece of material information that you can. So anything that would influence you and uh, steer you into making the positive, correct decision is game. And uh, when the book was written, most of the information that you could get was just financial data. More about that later. And then the second thing that they said that you needed to do was to try to figure out what they called the intrinsic value of the company. And that's something separate from what the stock market thinks. The stock market thinks it's worth this. The intrinsic value that you arrive at by doing analysis is this, and if you can buy the company at a discount to the market, then it's likely to be a good investment decision. Now, the reason people looked at financial data, to be honest, was because most of the stuff that Rob was talking about simply didn't exist. And as a point of fact, I've been in the business long enough that in the early days when I started, all the financial data that you could get had to be copied by hand out of annual reports with a pencil, you know, and, and uh, uh, so that tells you a little bit about when I started. Today, of course, you can get financial data on your smartphone, so, so there, so, you know, anybody can get it. Uh, the problem with that is that in the beginning when it was really hard to get, uh, and you had to copy it out of an annual report with a pencil, you could gain an informational advantage over people who didn't do that, and uh, so it was a lot easier. And today, the data is unbelievably easy to get, so it is, in a way, uh, a lot less useful. Let's put it this way. Close to useless, but it's not quite at zero, but it's close to it. And so one of the things that we realized was that we had to augment what we knew about companies to gather every piece of material information using some other means. And so this is where sustainable investing comes in. And sustainable investing all is just a fancy way of saying that we're trying to figure out which companies are actually going to be successful over the long run by looking at every piece of available information. Now, this has some social implications too, which I'm gonna to get to. But the first is that if you think about the way we just talked about what Microsoft does, it's pretty clear that one of the reasons why Microsoft wants to use less energy is because energy costs money, and the less it uses, the more efficient it is, and therefore it's most profitable. But it has a positive effect on the world outside the company. More about that later. But So sustainable investing is really about evaluating every resource, every asset that a company uses that it marshals in its business model, and to figure out whether it's doing that as well as it can, and whether it's going to be a successful business that delivers a product or service that people want. The thing that's interesting about that is that a lot of the assets at companies today aren't actually physical things. In fact, uh, Two-thirds of all the companies in the world in developed countries are service companies, so you could argue they have almost no assets at all. Most of the assets are people. And I'll tell you right now, there isn't a single word in a financial report that allows you to evaluate whether the company uh, is good at keeping and attracting its talent, so you've got to look at something else. Um, so. Uh, you also have to figure out whether a company can innovate. And again, there's almost nothing in a financial report that tells you anything about whether the company's really good at innovation. So uh, one of the problems with just looking at financial data is that not only is it really easy to get, it tells you a whole lot less about the company. So one of the things that my team and I have pioneered and we've been working on now for almost a decade is to build a database of data factors that are not financial data that help us predict whether a company is going to be successful or not. So I'll give you an example. You'll understand this right away. Um, if you, how many people here own a Honda Civic? 
if, and how much of a discount could you get the dealer to give you when you bought it? Not so much. Uh, I bet if you go buy a Chevy Cruze, you can get a way bigger discount, and that is called brand equity, because they're roughly the same car. Well, I'll tell you something. If you look at a piece of data, it's called time lost incident data. It's the number of direct labor hours lost in a factory adjusted per 100,000 workers. It is 10 times more dangerous to work in a General Motors factory than a Honda factory. I'm not saying that's the only thing that determines why you pay more for a Honda Civic than a Chevy Cruze. But there's a direct correlation between industrial accidents, defects, recalls, and brand equity. And so the whole philosophy of how Honda runs its factories versus General Motors, which has improved over the years, still there's a huge gap there. And that is, results in direct profits to the company. And it means that you are more willing to pay for a Honda Civic than a Chevy Cruze. And that piece of data is highly, highly predictive. I'll give you another example. I bet a ton of people in here look at Glassdoor, right? Who looks at Glassdoor? Yeah, it's kind of like Yelp for companies, right? Well, we found out, and one of my colleagues wrote a PhD thesis on this, that you could, using artificial intelligence and machine learning, mine uh, Glassdoor data, and that it was predictive of the company's ability to keep and attract talented engineers, and this is critically important in knowledge-based industries. And in fact, uh, Berkeley uh, professors wrote a series of really interesting papers that showed that when the patent libraries at Sony and some of the other Japanese consumer electronics companies peaked about the time the disc man in the, the uh, cathode ray uh, cathode ray tube television was a, a, a hot thing. That's when their patent libraries peaked, all the engineers left for other companies, and my kids have no idea what a Sony Walkman is today, right? So that's all about innovation and trying to predict which company is going to be most successful over the long run. What we can show you is that using this data, we do look at financial data, we put the two together, we can more successfully predict uh, whether a company is going to be a successful investment or not. And we can also show you that companies that rank high on this particular data set, not only are they more successful over the long run, their, their results, their business results are less volatile. The interesting thing about all this is that companies that are good at doing exactly this create what uh, this guy, uh, Porter at the Harvard Business School called shared value. And the idea behind shared value is that a company can be a business success, like you were talking about Microsoft, and create external value to society at the same time at zero cost. That's the exciting thing about this, that actually the things that makes the business successful creates positive value in the external world. And what we were hinting at uh, before we got up here on stage was that uh, if you watch Fox News or listen to certain people, they will intimate that companies that are sustainable are somehow bad investments, and I can prove to you mathematically that it's actually the other way around, that sustainable companies are more profitable, more successful, and uh, grow faster than companies that are not, so why wouldn't you invest in them in the first place, and, you know, and avoid the ones that aren't? So. Uh, this is kind of turning uh, the logic uh, that people used to use in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s on its head, meaning that um, people used to think, well, factory safety costs money, therefore it, uh, it makes the company less profitable, but it's actually the other way around. Factory safety lowers your insurance costs, improves the quality of the product, which results in a more successful brand equity that people pay money for. So it, it's actually quite the other way around. Uh, better inventory management means that you can deliver the product using less parts and less time, which makes you more profitable. And some of these things are very, very subtle. And uh, I'll give you another example from real life. One of the uh, largest aluminum companies in the world is a, is a company called Norsk Hydro, which is located in Norway. And the reason it's one of the most successful aluminum companies in the world is because it's powered almost entirely by hydroelectric power, which in Norway is super clean, 
but it's also very cheap. And electrical power is the primary cost component of making aluminum. And so one of the things that our current president doesn't understand is that a 10% tariff on aluminum is of no use when you're trying to compete against a competitor that's probably about 40% cheaper. You know, actually doesn't make any sense. In fact, if you read the New York Times, you can find out that there are about 10 times as many jobs in the U.S. of companies that use aluminum than people who actually make aluminum. So you're actually working at cross purposes through the way the economy actually works. But I guess he's not a very good listener, nor is he a very good mathematician either. Uh, but, but this is the problem if you don't th think through these, these issues. The last area that I want to talk about is a really new area that we're working on, um, which is to try to figure out uh, quantitatively what is the external impact of a company. Now, this is a really interesting problem because the people who um, are pensioners or other investors all are thinking, well, if I invest in sustainable companies, I'm improving the world that I live in, but the question is, can I measure how much and whether company A has more positive impact than company B? And so uh, we started a project about two and a half years ago with a very large Dutch pension fund where we set about to try to do exactly that, to quantitatively measure the external impact of public companies. This is actually a pretty easy thing to do if you're looking at small private companies, so people have been doing that for a long time, idea being, Okay, so I take my money and I provide clean water to a village in Africa that doesn't have any. You can measure pretty directly how the people in that village benefit before and after. But if you're running a global company that sells products and services all around the world, then the math gets a lot trickier. Now, one of the things that we figured out was that we could use scientific models to try to come up with a way to quantitatively estimate the external impact of companies. And I'll give you an example. So you saw those wind turbines in the slide before. Well, so think about this. If you take a wind turbine and put it in China and you displace a coal-powered plant, you have positive impact. If you take that same wind turbine and add it to a grid like Norway, where it's already really clean, the incremental impact is actually pretty small. So one of the things that we did was to start building little micro models of these companies. So we started with a, a public wind turbine company. We know exactly how much power each wind turbine generates. We geolocated every single wind turbine. We used uh, uh, a model from the Harvard School of Public Health. They have a grid model, so we know the composition of the grid in every country around uh, the world, and so we can estimate how much dirty power is being displaced by that wind turbine. And then the Harvard School of Public Health has a statistical model that says if you have a plant that emits uh, uh, either CO2 or pollutants, we can statistically estimate how many people get asthma, how many sick days you, uh, you get, how many hospitalizations, and so on. And so you can back into the positive impact of every single wind turbine. And so basically we built a gigantic input-output model that allows us to quantitatively estimate the impact of public companies on the climate, on water, on health, and on food security. Food security is the last one. We're going to finish that in about three or four months. So at the end of that, we'll be able to give our investors a report that will quantitatively estimate the external impact of the companies in which they invest. This will have, I think, colossal social consequences because it won't be up to some kind of subjective guess. We'll actually be able to tell you in real numbers, using real models based on science, that people can make better decisions on. And then if we can estimate this, then you can say, I'd rather give my money to company A that creates a bigger positive impact than company B. This is not possible today but we think it'll be possible in a year or two. Uh, and so we think this will have massive consequences for our industry. So with that, let me stop, and we're gonna do a little panel action. That's right. <clears throat> so just so you know, we're running a little bit long. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna play a video loop in the background of some of the companies that are here. And we're gonna do a panel discussion. I'm gonna invite Rob and Bruno to sit down. 
The most of the panel discussion is gonna focus actually on Jessica and April. And there's a specific reason why I wanna do it. From a very broad perspective, we started from what's happening globally. And then we went to Rob, who talked more specifically about different companies that are beginning to take advantage of some of the AI tools that are available to solve global warming. And finally, what I wanna do is I wanna talk about how many of you are brand or high school and say, this might be, I didn't know this would be a living. I didn't really wanna live in a van in Birkenstocks and tie-dye shirts going to, going to Grateful Dead concerts all my life. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I could actually make a living. How many of you were sort of interested in that? Nobody? Been, been there, really? done that. <laughs> Who's Grateful Dead? Wow, okay. <laughs> so what I wanna do is I wanna focus a little bit on April and Jessica, who are graduates um, of UCSB. And I wanna talk a little bit about what it means to actually make a living in this in this new environment. We talked about this being in the beginning of a transformative environment. These are two people that are starting and making a living doing this. And I want to talk a little bit about how they're gonna make their billions of dollars taking advantage of the catastrophe that people like me and Rob and Bruno have created. So um, let me start with you, Jessica, a little bit. Firstly, um, can you tell me, uh, what? just so everybody knows, you're a graduate of Bren, you're, going to, you're getting the PhD program at Bren School, is that right? Yes, I'm graduating from the PhD in the Bren School in June. Okay, and you gave me a really interesting insight. I thought there was a bunch of different interesting experiences you have, and I wanted you to share it with some of the people here about what does a job look like in sustainable kind of environments? Are you guys interested? Is anyone interested in a job when they graduate from college? Nobody, really? Anybody? High school, anybody? Interested, job, no? Brandon, yeah, job, okay, good. Chris, you too, great. So Jessica, can you tell me, like, you mentioned some interesting jobs that you had, and I wanna talk a little about them, about Apple, Dow, um, and, and even uh, Patagonia. Can you talk a little bit about what you did with uh, Apple and what you observed with them? Uh, sure, so in the time that I've been doing my PhD, I actually interned for Apple uh, the first two summers in their life cycle assessment group, and um, for those of us who don't know what life cycle assessment is, you actually measure the impact, the environmental impact of a product or process across its entire life cycle. So you take everything from raw material extraction through the production of that product, how it's distributed and how it's packaged, how it's actually used at the consumer, and then what happens to it at the end of its life. And you use this as an accounting method to measure things like carbon emissions, energy usage, water usage, to really optimize that system and find hot spots and ways to reduce that impact. Okay, so like when uh, Elsie Golden goes out there and says, Mom, I need a new iPhone. I absolutely need the new iPhone 8. What does that mean? What happens? Um, <laughs> when, from start to finish, the whole life cycle? Well, you don't have to tell me. <laughs> you can give me the summary about how, what your job impacts and how it matters. Um, Basically, it's identifying ways to reduce that impact. So one example is a couple years ago, Apple actually replaced um, the aluminum in the MacBook with recycled aluminum, which reduced the impact from aluminum by, I think, 52%, um, which obviously is a great emissions reduction, but also if you're using recycled material, I imagine saved the company some money too. Okay, and why is Apple doing this? Why are they doing it just because of the goodness of their heart? Are they doing it because they're being made to do it? Are they doing it, why are they doing it? Um, partially because it's the right thing to do, but I think also because it makes money. Okay, and you actually gave me um, an example of how this adjustment in changing the renewable energy source. You said, here's how much of an impact it makes. So Apple has a goal to basically use renewable energy, not, n not just themselves, but throughout their entire supply chain. And that amount of energy that they're working towards is four gigawatts, which is- Nobody knows like, what that means. Is that power um, an iPhone? It's a million US households, which is like three times the size of Rhode Island where I grew up. Wow, okay. So they're trying to reduce that kind of energy throughout their whole supply chain. Yes. Okay, that sounds really good. Now there's another company you work for that I wouldn't normally associate with sustainable anything. Um, it's Dow Chemical. Yes. So this would make me a story about how the infiltration of sustainability is actually beginning to penetrate companies that you would not even think about that are having to care about this for extraordinary reasons. Can you share us a little bit about what Dow Chemical was doing? 
Sure. Um, when I was there bef before I started my PhD, we were working on projects called green infrastructure, looking for ways to improve the operations in some of the manufacturing facilities. And one example of that was actually instead of building for part of the wastewater treatment plant a sequencing batch reactor, which is a traditional technology, instead we built a constructed wetland. And not only was this more effective at the wastewater treatment process, it had a lower environmental impact, and it saved the company almost $300 million over the course of 10 years. So the person who actually designed this facility got the highest award that the company can offer an employee, and it kind of launched a program to identify other kinds of green infrastructure technologies and educate engineers throughout all of Dow's manufacturing facilities so that we could use more of these as best practices. So this is a great example of a company that normally you wouldn't think of as particularly interested or concerned about sustainability, but from purely economic reasons now, sustainability is becoming a big deal. Yeah, is that a fair a thing to say? Yeah. Okay, that's great. You talked about something about greenwashing. So greenwashing is when a company actually presents to you that we're doing really great things, um, and maybe they're not. And I argued with you that the way you would know that is that the more public the thing that they're presenting to you, the more likely is that it's BS. So my argument was that if they say, this park brought to you by XYZ oil company, that may be greenwashing, whereas an example of kind of deep-seated true sustainability commitment actually is kind of under the covers. Can you explain that a little bit? Sure. So, I mean, you see all kinds of eco-labels. The word green is thrown around a lot. Um, and sometimes we don't really look farther than that. Um, but if you look at a company, I think this was part of the Patagonia example, if you look, they'll be transparent about their entire supply chain for certain materials. They'll actually take your clothes pack and repair them. And if you put a little common sense into the equation, if they're repairing your clothes, then they're not having to produce all of the materials to make a new one. Um, and so just kind of asking the question why and looking past just that word green or whatever that eco label might be, usually gives you enough information to really evaluate if they're doing something and it's more scientific or scientific enough. That's really good, thank you. Um, I wanna shift to you, April, a little bit. So you also went to UCSB and graduated, right? What yeah. do you think? We, can we verify that you graduated? <laughs> <laughs> I went to the Bren School. Great. That's fantastic. So look, there is a job for you guys out there. I know that you're all panicking, those of you in your second or third years. But there is a job for you out there. Is that right, April? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> now, I've heard on Fox News that um, all the environmentalists are pushing these policies so they can become billionaires. And I just wanted to ask you, firstly, are you making more than a million dollars a year working at CEC? Oh, the local environmental nonprofit where I'm employed, I make just shy... No, just shy I of a million dollars? Make one million dollars? Fantastic. It sounds like a great opportunity. <laughs> but well, there, it is a great place to work. I, I love that. So tell me, why is it a great place to work? Well, I've learned so much about, about my community. It's, it's a very satisfying line of work. Um, I feel like I'm really making a difference in, in what I'm doing. And I know that you've kind of hinted at not wanting to have this really crunchy feeling about going into the environmental field. But especially in this community, it is, I can see you making fun of me, but no. <laughs> <laughs> especially in this community, working at, at a nonprofit where you do get to connect with, with your local policymakers, I get to go and talk to the city council, talk to the board of supervisors, and really think through these local policies and even sometimes state policies that really do drive the environmental decisions that individuals and companies um, make. I actually think this is really critical. So I, I wanna make sure, I'm gonna go on record, I'm not actually against crunchies. Uh, neither am I against people that wear Birkenstocks, tie-dye shirts, or chain themselves to trees. I'm in favor of all of them. What I'm also trying to make sure that you guys understand, though, is that the former trade-off that we used to have to make, which is that if you wanted to be environmentally conscious, if you wanted to try and do the right thing, it meant that you were going to have to live a life of poverty living in a yurt somewhere. And what we're trying to um, expound upon a little bit is that there is a livelihood that is out there, and it can be fulfilling, meaningful, and matter to you. And I think that's what April is very clearly articulating that has nothing to do with economics. Is that a good way of saying it? Sure. And so now, 
sort of a tepid support, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what I'm gonna do now, I wanna ask you though, there is an economic thing that you're working on right now that I think points to the economic opportunity, and I wanna kind of bring it very locally. Um, my wife actually talked and actually complimented you. You brought together about 80 different developers uh, recently. And just so you know, there is a bid right now on the table for a peaker plant, which is um, an alternative energy source. We're at the end of a transmission line. So what that means is that at some place between here and Ventura, if our energy gets cut off, say in a big storm like this, um, the problem is there is no alternative way for us to get energy. And so Southern California Edison typically will go out and say, well, we're gonna create a peaker plant. And what that means is when you're in an emergency situation, we'll run this plant, it's like a little, like your house generator, right? The generator that you use as your backup generator, that's what it's like, but it's for a city of 300,000 people. Does that make sense? But these peaker plants typically cost 100 to $200 million, and they just sit there, and they use natural fired gas, and the typical process is to go out to bid and see who can give me the, the cheapest peaker plant. But people like April, and this is extraordinarily difficult, has had to go out and coordinate with government officials, with energy officials, and with the public to create awareness about a different option. Can you share us what that option is? Yeah, so just to kind of expand a little bit on, on this idea. So Edison, you know, our energy company in Southern Santa Barbara County, Southern California Edison, is required to have a certain amount of energy that is produced locally. And that's kind of to get at um, what you're saying, that if there is some sort of disaster, we need to have a more localized source of energy. And currently, we get a lot of that energy down from gas-fired peaker plants in Oxnard. And as those um, gas-fired plants are coming offline, Edison needs to plan to take the place of that electricity. And so they have this one plan to build a big gas-fired plant down in Oxnard, but you know what, there was a lot of community opposition from that, and that, that's not something that I was necessarily leading, but it was very, very powerful. And this was because it was in a community where people had faced a lot of environmental impacts from the generation of electricity. So, so that's kind of the backstory here. And then, so Edison is saying, all right, we need to replace this energy. And so there was all of this energy and activism saying, well, where is this energy going to come from? And Edison announced an opportunity saying, all right, all of you energy developers, bring your bids to the table. We are looking to buy sources of renewable energy. So we are looking to buy your kilowatt hours of solar. We are looking to buy your kilowatt hours from battery storage, and maybe even you can source a wind farm here. So my organization worked with several other organizations to just try to get the word out there. So we talked to people who could potentially have a big solar farm on their building or in, in their, on, their, um, on their property and their yards, you know, beyond residential, but I'm talking pretty big scale here. And we brought these people together and we brought these developers together and we just tried to facilitate this exchange of ideas. So there's quite a bit of money there. And when you, when you say that I, I met with these developers, these are really hungry developers. And it's just kind of repeating this idea that there is so much money and so many economic opportunities for renewable energy growth. And um, there's quite a possibility that this could happen here in Southern Santa Barbara County and we could have quite a bit of renewable energy growth as a result of, of this bid opportunity from Edison. How many of you would like to make $100 million? Anybody? Okay, great. So talk to April. She has a path. Um, but some of this has to do with something as simple as, you know, putting in covered parking lots, right? And you just cover them with solar. You pair with a, with a developer and you can do that, right? Whether it's schools or parking lots or things like that. Or you're already pairing with the, the city of Santa Barbara. And you can potentially pair with other, the Tobes group. Anyone here know the Tobes group? Nobody? Nobody? Seriously? Oh, you know the Tobes group? Can you call them up? Because April would like to talk to them more. <laughs> I think they're already involved. Um, but the point is, is that there's $100 million of opportunity. And if you were going to make an argument for this as the right resource, firstly, you should know that what she's done and the work that she's done has transitioned Southern California Edison from being saying the default is to get a natural gas plant to saying our preference 
is a renewable energy source. That is a massive, massive change that April and the CEC has managed to do. Do you understand that? The default used to be we're going to get to put out to bid a natural gas plant. Now the preference that they've gone out with is renewable energy. And it just speaks to a $100 million opportunity that used to be to a natural gas plant shifting to solar and wind power. So and, and just because I know you, you do like numbers, it's probably closer to at least half a billion. Thank God you got, so I've been pressing April. I said, please give me a number. I said, is it 100 million? She says, well, I'm not really sure. Half a billion dollars. So those of you who didn't raise your hands when you said 100 million was enough, how about half a billion? That's high key, half a billion enough? Okay. So that tells you, and if I was gonna try and sell this project, there's a big difference too, because she brought, pointed out something else as well. A peaker plant only comes online and provides energy in an emergency, typically, or when you're trying to make sure it works. Can you explain the difference in the benefits as a public good to what a renewable energy source like solar and wind would be versus a peaker plant? Yeah, so again, a peaker plant would be a gas-fired power plant that only comes online um, maybe during, well, definitely during an emergency, but also during our peak demand power days. So in the middle of the summer when we're all cranking our air conditioners, you know, not in Santa Barbara, but in Los Angeles. Um, so this peaker plant really doesn't run all that often as compared to these solar panels are going to be producing energy whenever the sun is shining. So it's a much more reliable source, source of energy and actually tends to be, you know, you can, that electricity is cheaper because you don't have to turn it on and turn it off. It's just always creating electricity. So in terms of a public good, in terms of what it delivers to the public, it's an ongoing energy source all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's great. Well, not at night. <laughs> when the sun April is that's very that's smart. That's when, the, that's when the wind comes in. This drives me crazy. So really smart people that know actually details, that's not my strength, but it drives me nuts because like she always like qualifies like, well, it doesn't work at night. I'm like, okay, but April, seriously, seriously, this is a $500 million opportunity. It's better in every single area. Mm, except at night. Okay, fine. Except at night. That's good. That's when you import wind power from Washington. There you go. You import there wind you power go. from Washington. We're also being transporting water from Washington as well. Um, let me talk to you about appeal for a second. How many of you actually got around to see the appeal demonstration? Okay. I want you guys just to hear a little bit. I think it's just amazing. It's something as simple as food spoilage can actually be something that actually matters. I mean, who knew? Um, can you give me like a 60 second overview about what Appeal is trying to solve? What's the problem they're trying to solve and what's, sure. what's the size of the problem? Sure, so about a third of the food that we produce gets wasted. That's the same in the US as in a developing country. Although here, most of that happens at the retailer and consumer versus in developing countries, it's earlier in the supply chain because they don't have the cold chain. Um, that's a lot of food, and there's a lot of energy and resources and water and emissions created in producing that food that ends up going to waste. Um, I think two or three percent of the energy that we use in the US is in food that's thrown away. So Appeal basically is trying to solve that problem by extending the shelf life of fresh produce using as minimal resources as possible. So we actually take plant-derived materials and extract something from that that's in every fruit and vegetable that we eat today and use that as the primary ingredient, ingredient in our product. And we find in all of the different produce categories that we've tested at least a 2x shelf life extension. Okay. Can you give us an idea of the scale of the impact? How much money are we talking about? Is that, is that, a, is that a big deal, a little deal? Is that like a $10 problem or is that a multi-trillion dollar problem? It's a huge problem. Oh, I hate it when you guys say huge. No one knows what that means. It's like, for them, some people, that's $100. Is it a $100 problem or bigger it's than that? It's in the billions. Billions of dollars. Okay, great. And how many people does, does Appeal have right now? 86. 86. Growing every day, it feels okay. like. Okay, and, and in terms of the funding that you've received, how much money have you received? Uh, $40 million. Okay, and I heard that some of these people, um, you guys might not have heard these people, but can you share some of these people? They're, they're kind of not very well-known people. Can you share some of the people that have invested in the company? Sure. Um, Andreessen Horowitz, um, DBL Partners, Upfront Ventures. Um, we also have some money from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. 
Who's the last one? <laughs> Bill and Melinda Gates. I've heard of them before. Rob, do Maybe you know who Rob they are? I might, I might know some of those. Ones. Okay, you might know some of them. Okay, and why are they interested? They want to solve this problem too. Okay, are they looking to make a lot of money off their nonprofit organization? Um, I don't think so. Okay, that's great. No. What about Andreessen Horowitz? I don't really think of them as nonprofit people. I don't think they are. I think they're trying to make money. Yeah, they're like the biggest investment capital VCs in the world. They're the most voracious capitalistic venture capitalists in the world. Did I say that right? So what I'm saying is you have people like Bill and Melinda Gates who are trying to do this because it's the right thing and a good thing to do. And they're being paired. And what we're seeing now is a bridge between people who are literally interested in making as much possible capital as they can. And so you no longer have to make a choice between trying to do something that you think matters and doing something that'll make you actually make a good living. Does that make sense? Is that a good? To me. That's, for me, that's a really good metaphor, right? The Bill and Melinda Gates and Teresa. Do, Rob, no? OK. All right. Um, so let me ask you both, and I'm going to extend it to these two. Um, both of you, what's ironic here, um, both Jessica and April have science degrees. Do you think your liberal arts, or do you think liberal arts is even relevant at all today? Do I? Yeah, I, I definitely do. Um, Why? When, when I was in college even doing, pursuing an engineering degree, I was in Engineers Without Borders. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that organization. And actually half of our chapter was liberal arts students. Um, and that was because in order to implement the social infrastructure and the community development necessary to support these scientific and technical projects that we were putting into the ground there. We needed the social infrastructure to make sure that the systems were maintained and that there was community support for them. And yeah, I think that it's pretty obvious that we have to work together to solve these problems. April, you made an interesting comment to me too. I said, does liberal arts even, is it even relevant? Does it even matter at this point? Um, you decided to get a science degree. I did. Um, you don't have to apologize for it, it's okay. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I think they're both very important pieces of the puzzle. All of this research is being done in science. I mean, my organization, the Community Environmental Council, is really looking for local solutions to climate change. So we believe the science. We, we know that it exists. We know these things are happening, but really, what we're doing is we're looking for behavior changes. And so we need to be able to communicate really strongly what people can do and what decisions companies and individuals can make. And I think that a liberal arts education is key in, in doing that type of work. So I think what's ironic a little bit too, and, and maybe I'll, I'll, oh, I wanna actually have you both talk about this too for a second. And, and I apologize, I don't wanna make this like a topic of, I don't know, identity stuff, but What's interesting is in science, unlike computer science and other things, environmental science is, is it 50-50 men and women? What is it? How, what's the, do you know what the breakdown is? I think I there's, I, there's more women than men in environmental science in, in my experience. Okay. So there, there's actually a, a place for women in science? <laughs> <laughs> Are, are you sure? I didn't think they were, I, I thought that they weren't smart enough for it. Is that what's happening? Or what, I'm sorry, what happened? I'll, I'll just say that over half the people on my team are women. <laughs> did you hear, did you hear what, what Rob just said? Over half the people on my team are women. Wow. Half of my team are women and one of them is a PhD in environmental science, so there you go. That's great. And what's ironic is, I'm sorry, what science degree do you have, Rob? Uh, MBA. In, I'm sorry, what science degree do you have, Rob? An MBA in what? Corp finance. Okay, so just so you know, corp finance is what you do when you don't think you're smart enough. Um, I, I have an MBA too in, in finance too or whatever. It's what you do when you don't think you can get um, a, a, a later degree in science. An MBA is the next easiest thing. Do you agree? Mm, not exactly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I and, will, and, yeah. and Bruno, what's, what's, your, what's your major in? Well, I studied art history and philosophy undergraduate. Oh, really? <laughs> did you hear that, Ryan? Alex? Did you, so do you know anything about Carl Jung? 
Yeah, I Nietzsche? Do. Yep. Okay, you guys want to talk to him later about that <laughs> in the Q&A section? Okay, and are those, are those liberal arts schools yeah, relevant so, today? Talk, can you talk yeah. a little bit about it? Oh, so I get asked this question a lot because I travel around and go to universities. I thought it was unique, come on. No, it's like follow what you're interested in. Like don't try to figure out what's gonna get you to, from point A to point B. Follow what you like doing and you'll find your points. Like, I was an English major, then I got an MBA, then I wrote software, like, it's okay. And I, I'm fortunate, I'm super, super lucky. I, I know the chief sustainability officers are pretty much all the top 200 companies in the world and their backgrounds are totally diverse. But the more interesting thing is, you know, I talked about like the 38 projects that we invested in or these AI grants. People come from every single background you can imagine. And the one thing they have in common is passion for the outcome. So just figure out what makes you happy and go. Like there is opportunity, there are resources, there's more money than there's ever been. You mentioned DBL as one of the investors. There's capital everywhere, but you know, I have a really close friend of mine who also, I went to Wharton, he went to Wharton. And he like got off the corporate track and he moved to Guatemala and he's distributing a million cook stoves to people in Guatemala. And he's like, it's about emotional income. Like, you know, I got other friends who went to Wharton who literally make significant millions of dollars a year and are miserable. Like, do what you love to do and you will find your path and that's the common denominator of the people who I see making the biggest difference in this movement. That's really good, I like that. Thank you very much for that. Um, I wanna open up, we are at um, quarter till eight. I know it's kinda late, it's been a long day, but I did wanna make sure that, that I have, make sure we have conversation and, and questions for our panelists. Do you guys, nobody, nobody, seriously? Really, just just these two guys, none of the students, really, just these two guys. Okay, go ahead, sir. When you do what you wanna do, <clears throat> not to bring the elephant into the room, but how do you reconcile Trump, who would stand to, re to return all the things you've been trying to accomplish back to zero or, be, or before that time, and be able to reconcile the fact that I think places like Monsanto are able to get away with what they do, and the GMO, don't let me get started, and the GMOs, and all the other things that affect the health and well-being of this planet. What chance do we stand when this, these forces align themselves against us, the people of the planet, who are trying to save the planet, and to do what's good for the planet, and fight the lobbyists to buy off those in the Congress, et cetera, and including the President, to work against our best needs and to just defeat us at every turn. How, how do you, with your fertile mind, able to reconcile that this can happen and that you are, are, are pitted against this kind of resistance? Enough said. I think you were looking at me. Um, <laughs> So it's interesting. There has never been more investment in clean tech and environmental outcomes than there is today. Even in the face of the geopolitical challenges, and today they happen to be in the, the US and some of the regulatory frameworks. You know, I've been traveling to China, I went to China in the 80s, and been going to China. China's reduced its air pollution in Beijing and most cities around the world the country by 20 to 35 percent in the last three years. And so it's very tempting to get into a US centric view on these things, but when you think at a planetary scale, it's like things ebb and flow. And I don't think, I don't want to speak for my colleagues, but I spent a lot of time with, like I said, the s chief sustainability officers or my peers at all these companies. Most of us are not confused. It's a long game, right? And so even in the face of some of these issues, there's been a crazy amount of opportunity created by the regulatory changes that have happened. Right? I don't know how many people are aware, like there's a $50 bounty on carbon sequestration in the new federal budget. Kind of got in there, everybody sort of scratched their head, but when you look at it, if you can put carbon in the ground or you can put it into biochar, or you can put it into plants or trees or whatever, and you can figure out how to actually do it, maybe with blockchain, you can make $50 a ton. 
We pay like $2 a ton on the open market, $13.50 or maybe $14 now in California for a ton of carbon. The federal government just told us that they would put a price of $50 a ton on a ton of carbon. So you got to look for all the opportunities that exist and take advantage of them. And sometimes things go great on regulatory frameworks. Sometimes they don't. The states move, the federal government. So it gets back to optimizing the opportunities that we have. There's so many things to go do that while it's easy to maybe get lament, lament about some of these problems and challenges, I could find a role for everybody in this room to do something environmental and have meaningful impact tomorrow morning. Okay, wait, that, what that means is his um, information is on our website and all of you <laughs> looking for jobs should be sending him a note. After it is about summer. networking, seriously, LinkedIn. Yeah. LinkedIn with me, it is about networks, 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 networks. Everybody, you, like, the crazy thing is, like, I did real estate development in my 20s. Like, I talked about what we did on the, the buildings and building energy optimization. I go back to that network now. I'm like, why aren't you guys deploying software? Why aren't you saving 20% of your energy? That's what I said, like, follow things that you like doing. And if you're passionate about the environment, you will find, like, I had this engineer come up to me, and he's like, I want to work on your team. I'm like, what do you do? And he says, I'm an engineer. And I said, which team are you in? He goes, I'm in Windows. I go, huh, what do you do? Oh, I'm a test engineer. I said, did you write a test harness to figure out the energy efficiency of Windows? Because the last time I looked, we had like a billion and a half customers. What if you could save like, I don't know, two watts an hour across a billion and a half customers running their computers 18 hours a day, 365 days a year? That seems like a lot of impact. You don't need to be on my team. You need to be where you are. So find the sustainability. That's what I tell people all the time. It's like, don't think sustainability is something out there. It's where you are. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Every job, every person I talk to, I'm always like, what are you going to do tomorrow in your role? That's the magic. It's not, and Paul Hawken talks about this. He's a big environmentalist all the time. He has this thing called Project R down. He's like, it's a billion X. It's not Monsanto changing the way they do GMOs. Yeah, that's interesting and important, but you know what? It's way bigger than that. You guys understand, what, what he's saying is it's looking for the intersection of what you like and that what might matter in sustainability. Oh, Does everybody understand that? Okay. So without, I'm making fun of people and saying, you know, should you be not doing global, whatever, liberal arts or science? Think about what you like and what you're good at and what is also a public good. And it's the intersection of those things that create real opportunity. And that's what he's talking about. Um, sorry, sir. Yeah, we've been talking about these kinds of things since the 60s, actually. I'm kind of old now. Um, went I'm to UCSB. And I'm I so sorry. <laughs> it's taken us this long. But I, and I don't think that it's all my generation that's the impediment, but I want to know. Um, I went to law school to be an environmental lawyer, but when I graduated, the only people who were paying were the bad guys. Um, I still am a lawyer and have found a way to uh, deal with my passion for the environment and uh, organics and good food and all of these things. But we've been talking about this for 50, 60 years. What's the biggest impediment to moving the dial at a, at a rate faster than, okay, this is the greatest amount that's ever been, but when you compare it to how long it's been to get to this point, we're, we're, I, f I feel like there's a big challenge in, in getting, changing the consciousness, and I think that's really what it's about. So just, just to rephrase, um, Matthew's this poor gentleman that's been involved with this for over 50 years, and he's saying like, really? Are we still talking about this? What's really moving this along? And Bruno or, or, or you guys, you guys want to talk about maybe from the younger generation perspective? or? Well, I think one of the impediments is either lack of information or the inability to get the correct information to make the right decision. So, for example, most large companies can't roll up their, their electric bill. They can't do it. It's paid locally, and if you ask uh, the CFO or the CEO, do you know which factories use less power than other factories? They have no clue because they just don't have the information system to make a good decision. So I think... It's not available. What? It's not like it's not available. Oh, it it's costs... The consciousness of looking for... Right, but it, it's not simple. Like you heard, it's like, not a Rob, simple... 
it's, well, it's not a simple problem. Rolling up this data is a real challenge. You've got to have someone inside the company that militates in a direction of doing it. And then you've got to have people willing to take action. Now, what I have seen is that the leaders in industries figure out that this is a worthwhile thing to do because in the end it, it makes money and saves money and then the rest of the industry gets left behind. But I have seen a much greater level of interest in making these kinds of decisions and doing the right thing because in the end um, it does make money. I mean, it makes money and it does the right thing at the same time. So. Um, I'm pretty optimistic. I mean, I see a lot. I see a lot of big public companies. I mean, uh, where I work, we manage collectively across asset management 800 billion dollars. Wealth management is a trillion dollars. I would say, you know, more so than ever, I see people making the right decision now. But, you but, know, better but, data would lead to better decisions. Yeah, and I also will say, I've been doing this job for 10 years. I get called into a lot more investor meetings than I ever have before. I get called into a lot more investor meetings to explain what we're doing on environmental sustainability, and I know my colleagues do too. Where it used to be an anomaly, it's kind of the rule. What, what's happening, what Rob even described and is saying is like, first thing, you have to have a system, and I think that's what you created with, uh, with the Zoo'er, is a system for saying like, how much energy are we using, and at what time of night? And the second thing, so that's what you've already created. And so an infrastructure being in place, that makes it simple for people to make decisions about it. And that's happening. It's been 55 years, and I understand your frustration with it, but it is happening. I'm still going for it. I know, I know. And sorry, go ahead. I Jessica. just have one other thing to add. I think that... Oh. Oh. I, I actually think the value for a lot of our students would be to understand... In the state of California, we're supposed to be very progressive. We have a lot of renewable energies. We dump them. It's obvious, you know, I don't know if the students know that, but a lot of our renewable energies just go right out into space. Is there a thought? Is there a process? Would any of our students benefit from understanding storage or like a new network or like a new infrastructure? I think that might be more solid for our audience and you know so what is a yeah. uh, what's what, a possible potential what's storage energy storage no so what is it like yeah, what gonna, is it that's a good question so there's this belief that energy storage is a physical medium in which you put electrons right so I'm going to put it in a battery I put it in lead acid or maybe I'll get lithium ion or maybe I'll get electrolyte there's a company there's a bunch of companies who use like literally Think about electrolytes and different kinds of technologies. And it's awesome, right? And we're using and testing all of, as many as we possibly can, like all over the place. A battery is also what I talked about a little bit earlier, which is if I can perform a given unit of work at any given time of day, and so instead of doing it when it's a coal peaker plant or a gas-fired peaker plant, I do it in the middle of the night when the wind's blowing in Washington State and the marginal cost of energy is almost zero, and the carbon is zero, that's a different form of energy storage. Like we think about things like thermal storage, electrolytes, lithium ion. Like I think the opportunity is to think non-linearly about this stuff. Like we've constrained ourselves to thinking that energy is electrons sitting in some unit. It's not, it's the output, and actually Bill Gates actually did this formula like eight years ago or seven years ago, but it's about like, What's the productive unit that you're trying to get, right? And so that's the outcome. It's energy, right? And so it's interesting. I was just challenging only because I think part of the supposition when you hear a question about energy storage is it's some physical medium, Yep. right? It's reinventing the rules. Can we ask, this gentleman's been waiting patiently. Can we go ahead? So the, similar to the tobacco industry, which engaged in a 50-year rearguard action of predatory delay against regulation and, and against uh, the, you know, the cancer war. The carbon industry is doing the same thing today. It, it, everyone who's a leader in the carbon industry knows that climate change is real and they are intentionally confusing the public with predatory delay and they're weaponizing um, AI platforms to, uh, and persuasion techniques to do that to the public. So I, I guess my question is, 
what's our best defense against that? How do we fight this predatory delay? And is there a way for us to use AI on our side to help us make decisions that are, that are in accord with our values? So first I would maybe challenge your supposition a little bit. So look at a company like Shell. They've invested and they're significantly in electrification of gas stations. And they're buying software technologies to reinvent what it means to be an energy company. So while I won't disagree that there are many actors and companies in the system who are desperately holding on to the status quo, I'm super lucky that like most of these are Microsoft customers and so they come to Microsoft every once fairly often and I sit in the room with their, a lot of their boards. And it is awesome to hear how these executives are starting to wake up. Not 100%, never gonna be 100%, but it's like, you know, look at, I think it's Eon, E.ON, which was the largest holder of coal and high carbon energy production plants in Europe. They shed most of that business and now they're a renewables energy and energy optimization business. So I think it's like, I think Albert, you even said this at the beginning of the night is, Look at the Fortune 10, Fortune 50, Fortune 100 30 years ago and look at today. They're not the same. I mean, it, Toys R Us shut today. Like, that was like the company where I went and bought all my kids' stuff, right? Um, I don't think it's a winning strategy in the long run, right? And so I think it'll be really interesting to see, but the people who've embraced the new paradigm, I think, are going to be way more successful. And hopefully a few people in this room will create some new paradigm that upends those kinds of companies who are, are thinking that the world is static. The world is not static. Like yeah, it, the evidence is huge there. Yeah, from where I sit, two things. First, uh, the best run companies in the traditional energy space are transforming their business model to something else. So for example, you look at an interesting country like Norway, which is a small country with very few people and an enormous amount of money that's all derived from oil, transforming Statoil, which is the Norwegian state, state oil company, into a wind power company. Sit around and wait a little bit, and it will be a wind power company. And the other thing is that there is such a thing as market discipline, which is that the, the market will impose a result on the companies fighting this rear guard action. It's a little bit like saying uh, at the turn of the century, uh, these newfangled cars, uh, no one's ever going to buy them. I'm just going to keep making buggy whips. You can do it, but not for very long. There's, um, and I apologize, so we're at 8 o'clock, so I would like to um, invite people to say later and ask questions to people personally. And I mean you personally, because I don't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry, I just was told that at 8 o'clock. And I mean you personally, I want you to be able to answer, ask your question here. Okay, go Once ahead. Ask away. Ask the question. So I don't need mic. I'm loud enough. Um, so I think some an idea that a lot of you have touched on, and I think all of you represent. I don't know if you guys do. Oh, okay, for the TV. Got it. Oh, for the recording. Oh, okay. So an idea that some of you have touched on specifically, and I would say all of you represent, is the idea of innovation and. I would like to hear from all of you what you think fosters innovation and how we can continue as students to make that excel in the workplace. I'll start if that's okay. Um, and I kind of want to speak to it from a Peel's perspective too. And I think it, it also kind of addresses some of the previous questions, but trying to take the environment and sustainability into account from the offset and truly understanding how our technology development interacts with the natural world is really hard. And it's something that we haven't done very well over the last however many decades. That's evidenced by why we're talking about all of these things. And so truly trying to understand nature and work with it not against it is largely the premise for how we're approaching innovation. And it's really, it's aspirational, it's really hard. <laughs> so that's what we're trying to do. Well, one, one thing I would say is it's very difficult to manufacture innovation. I mean, you can say, I'm gonna build a program to innovate, but 
I would say more often than not, innovation comes from unexpected directions, from unexpected people. And one thing that's always influenced my thinking was um, a quote from the very famous French scientist. He said, chance favors the prepared mind. In other words, the opportunity is often missed by people who haven't set themselves up to recognize the opportunity. And if you look at the whole history of scientific discovery, an enormous number of scientific discoveries were completely accidental. You know, a bunch of one scientist playing with aniline discovered uh, artificial sweeteners. Um, artificial dyes were discovered by accident. Uh, and you could, you know, x-rays were invented by accident. And the key was that the person that experienced this accident figured out how to turn it into something useful. And I would say, um, we had a leadership conference at my company, and the thing that we talked about was, how do you set yourself up to actually recognize the opportunity when you see it? Um, I'll give you a tiny little experience from my early past. When I was in business school, we had to do a marketing project, and I got sent with a, a woman who went to General Motors, a guy who was an engineer, and we went to Xerox. And we worked on a project to predict the size of the facsimile uh, machine market. And we did that by estimating the number of FedEx packages and drawing some curves. And we said, but listen, you know, uh, this is assuming that a fax machine costs 5,000 bucks. What if it costs 500 bucks? The market would be this much bigger. And the executives in question laughed at us. They said, this will never happen. At the same time we were having this discussion, we were walking down the hall of their executive offices and there was a little machine with a screen and a mouse. And we said, this is the coolest thing we've ever seen. They said, these guys out at uh, California invented this thing, but we have no idea what the hell to do with it. And so this is just a really good example of people actually having innovation in front of them and not being able to figure out what to do with it. I'll, I'll just quickly say, what fosters innovation, I think, listening to people, reading, and playing. I think experimenting, maybe stepping away from our screens as whenever we can and interacting with each other and really taking the time to get to the why of why people do the things they do. And, you know, people have it figured out a little bit. So, so listening and asking another person why they do the things the way they do them um, I think is really helpful for innovation and then playing with those ideas. So I think it's um, passion. Innovation's really hard. It takes a lot of perseverance, a lot of luck, right? And passion. So some people are motivated by finances and money. Some people are motivated by social change. Some people are motivated by problem solving. I mean, I, and you probably hear that theme coming out from me a lot. Like, Find your passion, that's the thing that sustains you. Right? Like People say to me, how many hours do you work a week? I go, I don't know. <laughs> like I'm reading books on environmental science. Is that my job? Maybe. I don't care. Like The passion is the thing. Hmm. All right, we're going to wrap wait, it up wait, right there. I, Any fa final what, comments? Yeah, Albert? I thank you, Michael. I do. So two final comments. So one is, I totally agree with Rob, is like it's finding your passion. I would think the other thing that drives innovation is a combination, is the intersection of your passion and when the consequences of not finding a solution to something are worth an extraordinary amount of money or the consequences to life. And when those things intersect, your interests and the consequences being super high, then you have something that you can create amazing things um, when those things are together. So whether it's engineering and computer science, so talking to you guys back there in DP engineering, whether it's liberal arts, um, to pack, talking to you, Alex and um, Ryan about, wait, why did you do that? About um, whether it's philosophy or anything else and saying um, persuasive argument, right? Today, our issue with, with um, a lot of things we have technological solutions. It actually has to do with convincing the 40% of the public in the United States who doesn't believe that any of this stuff is necessary, right? So liberal arts has a huge play in that. So does technology. All of it does. So find what you're good at, what you like, 
and where it can make a really good public difference, and you'll find innovation. That would be my argument. My last final comment is this. Um, all you young people that have stayed here for three hours, some of you during finals week, some of you traveling more than an hour, um, we are all adults, and one of my pet peeves is that as adults, we tend to tell you what to do, and when you do it, we say, you're being a leader, and that's awesome. What I would say is that although it's annoying, it's very annoying for us adults to hear when you guys disagree with us, it's healthy. And I think it's time for you guys, as high school students, as college students, I'm talking to you, Alex, looking at your iPhone, to say, that's fine. I'm going to push forward with what I think is the right thing to do. Does that make sense? And you don't need to wait for Rob, for Bruno, for me. I would urge you, you Ryan as well, you Alex, you Ethan, you know, this, and you Chris, Brandon, all you guys, push forward. Don't wait for us to point to you about what the direction you have to take. Take the direction. And don't think that reading about Carl Jung and Nietzsche is unimportant. It is. It forms your philosophy, it forms critical thinking, arguments, and persuasive skills, maybe the most important things that we do today. If they weren't, then our president would just press a red button and we wouldn't have to worry about North Korea. <laughs> Diplomacy matters, pervasive um, thinking matters, all those things matter. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I hope you guys enjoy this. Thank you.